Aloha. What's up, everybody? You're now tuned into yet another edition of BJPen.com Radio, the fighter's voice. As always, I'm your host, Jay Kinch. This is episode 105, special Thanksgiving edition. Happy Turkey Day to all of our listeners out there. We've got four great guests for this episode. We're going to kick things off with the pound-for-pound greatest fighter on the planet, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. Then we're going to be joined by fan favorite Walter Waite, who's now dropping back down to 155, Yancey Medeiros. Then following Yancey Medeiros, our good friend Gary Tonin returns to the show. He's going to recap his big win in Singapore at one championship, Heart of the Lion. And then finally, to wrap things up, we'll be joined by one of mixed martial arts' hottest young prospects, one championship fighter competing at what they, what is their featherweight, 155 pounds, Christian Lee. So there you have it, BJPenn.com Radio, the fighter's voice. Let's jump right into it. Coming up first for episode 105, Thanksgiving edition, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show the number one pound-for-pound MMA athlete alive today, a man that many consider the most technically proficient fighter to ever compete, the record-breaking, hardcore gaming, the man they call Mighty Mouse, Demetrius Johnson. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us today, DJ. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. How about you? I cannot complain, man. You know, Thanksgiving's a couple days away. Before we jump into things here, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? You know what? This is going to be the first Thanksgiving. Me and the wife and the kids, I'm going to do a damn thing. We're going to, you know, do what we love and be thankful for our, our health, our family. And we're just going to stay at home, not even order, not even cook turkey. We're not big turkey eaters, so we might just order a pizza and call it good, man. Right, that sounds great, man. So, does I mean, obviously you're not going to cook for this one, you're going to relax, but does Mighty Mouse get busy in the kitchen like he does in the cage? I mean, in the morning, I'm, I'm more of a breakfast dude. That's like my favorite meal of the day, uh, just because it, I, it's, I haven't eaten within 8 to 10 hours after sleeping, so breakfast is my favorite meal. Right, right. Uh, I, I don't get in the kitchen too busy when it comes to Thanksgiving at all. <laughs> Very good. Well, like you said, man, Lord knows, uh, you know, you've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, a family man like yourself accomplishing all that you already have. Now you're embarking on another chapter of your incredible journey with one championship. First things first, man, what was the experience like for you in Singapore? Oh, it was awesome. Um, you know, I, I've been to Asia before. Uh, my head coach, Matt Hume. He's always in Singapore working out there and traveling around in uh, Asia. And it, it was awesome. It was everything he said it would be. And uh, the the workers or the people who run one championship are awesome. Getting to meet every single one of them. They're all down to earth. Even the athletes I've met, they're all very uh, humble and down to earth. And it was a great experience. Now, being there for a live event, interacting with the Asian fans, like you said, the incredible team at one championship. Give us your thoughts on the atmosphere overall. Well, the atmosphere is fantastic, you know, very respectful. And uh, the, the biggest thing I love about the event was uh, it was almost like a event. You know, they had like the old school uh, presentation, you know, with the the fireworks, the, the big drumatron telling the story, showing the fighters come out, walking out. And then the entrance, uh, they have a new uh, woman who does his, does like the introduce it. <laughs> um, she, she was pretty cool. I, lo- I love the energy um, of everybody around. You know, uh, being around Chatri, his energy and his passion, not just for mixed martial arts, but just for martial arts in general, was uh, it, w- it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's it's reminiscent of Pride in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, you know, I, I've only watched Pride on DVD. When I was when I was young, I grew up watching more Asian mixed martial arts than uh, American martial arts. Right. So I, I was always watching, you know, Bushido, watching Crow Cop, uh, Sakurai, just all the, you know, Japanese Japanese fighters. Right, legends of their time. Uh, obviously, the downside of the event was, uh, you know, your longtime friend Bibiano Fernandez coming up short on the title defense. What was your reaction to that? Oh, you know, I was upset. You know, I'm I'm very biased because Bibby's my my friend and uh, training partner. So I always think he wins the fight. I, I still, you know, think he did one. You know, I think there's a couple things that uh, he, you know, didn't do what he usually does in the gym. But you know, we 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 win some, we lose some. I, I told him I went in the back and I I said, dude, I've been there. I was like, I was a champ for six years. 
And there's been time when I was fighting my last fight, you know, the crowd started chanting for the other opponent. And, you know, when you lose, it's, it's obviously devastating. But all you can do is pick yourself back up. You're healthy enough to go back home to be with your family. And that's and that's what it's about. We'll move forward. He'll get back in the gym and he'll get his rematch. And uh, we'll get after it and uh, fix the things that he did that he wasn't able to execute on and make sure he's able to do it this time when he fights uh, uh, Kevin Bellingham. Yeah, right. Kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, you just got to be thankful for what you have and the position you're in and, and, and keep moving forward. Uh, but in the press conference there, you had talked about Chatri being the only CEO you've, you've ever seen or uh, spoke that, that, that spoke so highly of his company and his athletes. You've been on the top of the game for such a long time. What makes Chatri stand out from all the other promoters in combat sports, in your opinion? Because it's, he's, he's, he's focused on telling the stories uh, the athletes, I've seen other guys are, but I, I truly believe he is. And he wants to b- build heroes in different countries. So, you know, they travel around to Myanmar, Jakarta, the Philippines. Uh, they're going to go to Japan. They're always in Singapore. And, they're, and they're, they're building heroes for the locals to look up to. And that's what he's, that's what he's focused on. And I didn't, you know, I, I've heard him say it all the time. And when I watched uh, Armand Song fight, and it was in his hometown, he defended his belt, the whole crowd was so moved by his performance. And I've never seen a crowd get behind their hometown hero like they have. You know, obviously, there's, you know, uh, you know California Kid. Uh, there, there's, there's that many I can name off, you know. Off the top of touch, it's, it's so far in view, but just to see how people were moved by it and how the kids over there are just like, I want to be like, I'm not sorry. You know, he came from poverty. Uh, he took care of his, his family. He took care of his children now. And he's such a great role model. You know, and he's, I think, I believe, uh, don't uh, quote me on this, I believe he's a school teacher. Um, and that's what Chachri's passion about. And then he's not only in mixed martial arts, but he wants to tell the stories of great martial artists. You know, he's got Georgia Protosian. He's telling his story right now. Uh, he's got great submission grapplers, uh, great Muay Thai guys, just all around, just not in one uh, atmosphere of, of, con- of combat and compete. It's everything. Absolutely, man. I would agree with you 100%. Just what they've been able to do with Ang La is truly incredible. I mean, you hear the crowds uh, when he comes out to compete, and you know, speaking with him, he's such a humble guy, but yet he can't even walk the streets in Myanmar. I mean, that's how much of a superstar he is. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true, and like I said, that's what, you know, obviously, you know, Chuck's just like, you know, we, we want to put up, we're putting on fights, but I want to sell, uh, I want to sell the stories, I, I want to build real-life superheroes, and so when I was there, and I, and I was listening to him talk, and, you know, he kept on driving that thing, and, like, you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, r- rose his attention about me is, you know, after I lost, so moved about how humble and how much humility I had where I was like, you know, I mean, he Shooter did a great job and, you know, give it off to him and his team, but now I got to go back home and, and get ready for that. And from that, he was like, I've never, you know, you, and he was like, I didn't even think you lost the fight. I mean, if you lost, it was very hairpin, you know, it was just the takedowns I got you, but I was just so moved by, you know, I was like, you know, when I heard there was an opportunity for, for you to be, you know, let go, like, I was like, I'm set you up immediately because that's, that's the I want under my my company. Right, right. We've had a pr- pretty close relationship with the company, and, and I've had the pleasure of speaking with so many of their athletes. The underlying message that always comes through when I talk to one athlete is that they feel respected, appreciated, and well taken care of by everybody they deal with. It sounds to me like so far you have that same sentiment as well. Uh, say that one more time. You kind of cut out. Yeah, no problem. I was just saying that, uh, you know, speaking with all the athletes that I've had the pleasure of speaking with from one, uh, they all agree that, you know, the, the underlying message or, or theme that they all have is that they feel respected, appreciated, and well taken care of by the company. Uh, I'd imagine you feel the same way. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't been with the company for that long, but so I, I, I felt uh, take care of and respected. So, um, and Baby Yon, he's been with them for a very long time. He's been a champion for a very long time, and he's, he's never had any complaints, and uh, he, he's happy, and he, he's always felt respected as well. Absolutely, absolutely. What I found incredibly refreshing about the organization is that they're focused on the purity of martial arts, kind of like you were just talking about with Chatri. You know, the Western model for promotion, 
it's become very similar to pro wrestling. And, and while that might, might be good for business, it's taken away a great deal from what the sport is intended to be, in my opinion. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do. You know, I, I don't watch it as much as I used to. Uh, I've been more in the Super Series, uh, kickboxing and Muay Thai, just trying to learn more uh, about stand-up and how they go about, uh, you know, creating opportunities to land uh, the big the big knockout. So, but I, I agree with you. It, it's just the, the nature of, you know, North America, right? Um, uh, you know, Habib Megamurdoff, he's out there doing a great deal of, uh, fixing well water for people in Nigeria. Right? Yeah, it's a beautiful and, thing, yeah. And I, I, I don't think that got a lot of head news uh, just because it's something good that he's doing in the world. It, it's, he's taking what he's worked so hard for and giving back to people that he has, that, that he's not related to. Um, and that probably didn't blow Twitter up, didn't blow Instagram up. And it's not, and I'm sure he didn't do it to do that. But what I'm getting at is that if somebody was out there and they did something bad right. or whatnot, right. that would have blown way, that would have created way more controversy than him out there doing good. So that's just the, the North American market. And, and I, I just bring up that situation just because it's fresh, it's new. But you also, in the past, I remember there was, uh, I, I can't remember who it was. It was a, uh, not, a fame, not a professional, but it was a, a, a musician. He spent... Uh, like four million dollars, and gave people in Africa, you know, it was Akon. water. Akon, yes, it was Akon. He gave them, you know, food, water, electricity, just a whole bunch of shit. And nobody even made a peep about that in news. But right. they had Kim Kardashian post some naked pictures of herself, and it's just, right. just breaking the internet. I'm like, here's a guy who's out there actually making, you know, good head news and trying to, you know, get back to. Uh, the community and here's a chick who's posting naked pictures and she's just you know obviously these guys don't do it but like I said that's just in North American market so when it comes to you know promoting fights and all that stuff and next thing you know you have all this stuff you know you have all this chaos and drama they're going to go over the drama instead of you know the good stuff but that's, that's the way it is it's North American market so I don't have to be involved with that anymore Right, right, right. Well, I was going to say, I, I know you've discussed this in other interviews, but I can only imagine that you have some kind of feeling of relief now that you're with a company with the values of one championship. It, it all aligns with your personal values and beliefs, right? 100%. That's, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, when you have fans, you know, when I was in North America telling me, dude, if you talk so much more shit, you get paid a lot more. And I was like, that's what I am. Like, even if I didn't like somebody, I'm still not going to talk crap about them. So... For me, always thinking true to my morals, my values, it, it, it kind of pays off in the end. Now I'm with a company where they're more, they uphold my values a lot more. We, we share the same values. Now, one of our lead writers, Tom Taylor, he had made a great point when this trade was first announced. He had said that one is a match made in heaven for a guy like you and that you would be truly appreciated by Asian fans. Two-part question here. First, would you agree with Tom? And second... Uh, why do you think that you never reached that level of superstardom in the West that everybody agrees that you deserve? Is it strictly that tr that trash talk like you were just discussing? Yeah, I, I agree that I think I'll get... I think the Asian fans will appreciate my skill set a lot more. Uh, I mean, they grew up... All the athletes over there are... Like, the average athlete over there is, is my size. And you guys... They have guys who are like, you know, King Yamamoto, a legend who's my size. Kyoto Gucci's over there doing work. I mean, uh, Iminari's over there, so there's a lot of guys of my size. And then the second part of the question, I don't know, to be honest with you, I just think it it's just, you know, the Western market. I mean, we, and the Western market, the North American market has great athletes. You know, Dominic Cruz, T.J. Dillashaw, I mean, Mom Marais, I mean, I can just go on the list. John Dotson, and I don't know if they're going to have the same stardom power uh, like a Conor McGregor or a, a you know, Tyron Woodley. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to say, right? Because what defines stardom power, right? Like, if I was to go off and dip my tongue, I think all those guys are stars. Right. But if you look at the far, if you look at the far few and many of those guys, like Nate Diaz is very popular because you have to war with Conor McGregor. Nick Diaz is very popular because of the way he carries himself and uh, he's kind of like, you know, this still Coach Steve off and he always fights with the boss. You know, you have John Jones, 
uh, Daniel Cormier. But then even then, it has transferred over, to, you know, to everything in the North American market is all based on pay-per-view buys, where it's like, oh, he's not a job because he didn't sell pay-per-view buys. It doesn't have anything to do with their skill set or anything like that, think, which, which is wrong with the North American models because they're all looking for the next superstar to sell that pay-per-view model. To where in, in Asia, they're not looking for that. They don't, they don't care if you can you know, out-sell a pay-per-view model because at the end of the day, you might be one of the best fighters in the world and you can't sell pay-per-view. You're, you're looked at as not a superstar. I mean, you look right. at, you know, uh, you look at, you have the, the top best athletes. You know, you have me taking on Harry Cejudo. You have T. Doshaw taking on Cody Garbrandt. I mean, that, those are legit, legit matchups. And, you know, based on the pay-per-view, they were like, oh, that, that, they're, they're not superstars. You know what I mean? So it's kind of hard to say, but I, I guess the North American market just didn't really care about the small guys, which is fine. Um, I'm not worried about it. Right. It's just, it sounds it's just the nature of the beast with Western fans, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I, I've, I've if I go up and ask people and I say, hey, why don't you like flyweights? Why don't you like bantamweights? I'm like, because you guys are small. I don't like watching small guys fight. Boom, perfect. I don't like chocolate cake. <laughs> you can't convince me to like chocolate cake. I like vanilla cake. I'm not going to argue. You're not going to argue. You're not going to convince me otherwise to like chocolate cake. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a chocolate cake fan either. <laughs> but uh, you know, oh, speaking you speaking of which, with with the small guys in, in America, what was your reaction to the news that the UFC would be dissolving the flyweight division? I mean, that kind of says everything about you know Dana and the company how they felt about 125, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they were talking about closing it two years ago. I mean, it's not the first time they've ever brought it up. You know, um, they talk about closing it when I was a champion, and I was like, okay, it is what it is. You know, my job to you know, go out there and display my skill set and uh, make you guys not close it otherwise. I mean, the last weekend's uh, event just showed you that the best talent in the UFC roster the flyweight division. I mean, Pantoja, that transition from the triangle to the arm bar, and he got an arm bar and went to the legs and took it back and choked him out. I mean, only a purist of pure martial arts who's a fan of it we understand what's going on. Now, obviously, you have the drunk dude. He's getting drunk off whatever he's drinking. Was <laughs> like, oh, they're 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 humping each other. It's like, no, dude. Like that is that is martial arts right there. That is he just did four. He just chased four submissions together and took you know Saki's back and choked him out. Like that is legit. You will not see a heavyweight do that. You will not see a middleweight do that. You would never see a featherweight do that. You might see featherweight. You might see Brian Ortega do that because he has that skill set, but. That's the problem with the Western market. They don't understand what they're watching. And, you know, they didn't they think they didn't take time to get educated on. So it's very unfortunate they have amazing athletes. I'm sure all those flyweights will fly homes. And, you know, I know a lot of them are going to move up to Bantamweight. But, you know, they're, they're, they're smaller dudes. Yeah. I know, I know Connor had called out Chatri on social media and said that, you know, he's kind of obligated to sign everyone who lost their job. Uh, do you agree with Connor? Do you think Chatri should go after all these guys? Connor is the idiot. We're talking about a guy who comes and throws a dolly at a bus and hurt, hurts multiple people on the bus. And I have nothing against Connor. This is, this is, I mean, come on the bus, hurts, you know, UFC employees and still has a job and nobody, I mean, what does he get? Community service? Right. And the UFC was just, the UFC was planning on getting rid of the flyweight division when I was a champion, finishing people, not not taking people to decisions, finishing people. And what, what I, I don't get where his logic comes behind that. Where, what makes him think that, you know, Chachi owes everybody something. So that, that's why it's like, Connor's, you know, he's, he's an idiot. I, I think he's just making head wave and, I mean, if he's so, you know, worried about flyweight scissors at a job, I'm pretty sure he has a huge stake in the UFC company now. I'm sure he can go to Dana like, Dana, you know, keep these guys. These guys are fucking amazing. Let's, let's try to do this right. Let's try to promote them. Let's do it, Dana. Me and you both can do it with proper whiskey. Let's sit down and have a good talk. I'm sure he can come up with something. Right. And if put, he was put, really wanted to do it. Right. Put your money where your mouth is, man. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, hopefully... Well, yeah, like I said, I mean... That's 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 Connor's that's Connor's opinion. What he thinks should happen, but 
like I said, this is a guy who just did this in, you know, the Barclays Center, throwing a dolly in the bus, hurting multiple people. I, I just don't, I truly think he doesn't care. But that's just my personal opinion. Right, right. Well, hey, man, actions speak a lot louder than words, so I, I think a lot of people would agree with you there. Hopefully it all works out for the guys that are stuck in that shitty situation, but, you know, you can't look in the rear view, as they say. you got to look ahead. So looking ahead for yourself, you're, you're going to headline the Flyweight Tournament for one for your promotional debut. Any idea on when that might be? I know it's going to be sometime in 2019. Uh, it's going to be tough. we got a lot of, we got a lot of killers over there, and it's going to look different. You know, I'm, I'm going to be fighting at, I'm fighting at my hydrated weight, which would be 135. So, uh, and it's weird because all the athletes over there kind of carry their weight different. You know, I, I met the strawweight champ out there when I was in Singapore. Uh, he walked, we were at the same height, but he walked around 132. So, I mean, I'm just built differently, I guess you can say. A little more muscle than some of the guys over there. There's, you know, Adrian Mertens. I know I, I met him. He's like 5'5", five, five, so he's a little taller, but he's skinny. Uh, not really skinny. He's got some muscle on him. So it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to a fresh new challenge and a fresh new, um, you know, fresh blood. Have you paid much attention to the one roster over the years? And is there anybody that really stands out to you as an interesting matchup? Not really, to be honest with you, because I've been so focused on my, you know, my previous roster. Right. Um, and I know more about the team, the Kai guys, because I've been helping Bibiano train for a lot of those guys. Well, not a lot of them, but just Kevin Bellahan. And then, you know, Reese McLaren, I helped him train for him. Uh, so all the guys I know, particularly on the one championship roster, is all the guys that help Viviana get ready for. You know, obviously I know about uh, Palang and other guys in different divisions, but not really in the flyway. I know about Adriano Moraes, um, you know, Jay Hay, but honestly, the only guys I know about is the guys who be fly. Like, actually sit right. down and watch fight. And I'm like, okay, this is what he does, and let's work on it or whatever. Right, and at the end of the day, when you're at the level that you're at, every fight is going to be a challenge. So, uh, you know, every fight has potential to be interesting. But I'm wondering, what, what country are you most excited to compete in? Uh, Singapore and Japan. Uh, those are the probably the most exciting ones I'm looking forward to compete in. Obviously, all of them. You know, I'll get to travel and get used to all that. You know, obviously, I wasn't a big fan of traveling uh, in my career because the different time zone. Uh, the weight cut in, but since I can fight more closer to my natural weight and, and all the athletes will too, then it will allow me to not be so stressed out about trying to cut, you know, essentially 15 pounds while traveling, you know, 14 or 15 hours. So I'm looking forward to it. Right, a much more level playing field. Uh, it, speaking of which, in regards to, you know, their headquarters being in Singapore, I know Matt Hume is, is pretty much relocated there, Rich Franklin as well. How is that going to work for you? Are you are you going to have to maybe move your family, or is it going to be a little bit easier for you as re, in regards to travel? Uh, you know, being with this new company. But no, so Matt's still based in uh, Washington State. So Matt isn't full time in Singapore, uh, and you know I, I just signed on to be on uh, Evolve Fight Team. So depending on where I'm fighting, when it's uh, if I'm fighting anywhere like in Singapore, Jakarta, places like over in that place of Asia where it's you know, Singapore's kind of like that, the, the headquarters. Right. Uh, like the time zone is like, you know, I saw Amir Khan. He was, he was also on a ball fight team. Uh, he was in uh, Singapore before he took off to, they're in, the Manila, they're in Manila right now. So the time zone is, you know, pretty much the same. So I will, you know, go out to Singapore probably two weeks ahead of my fight, train at ball fight team, get used to the time zone, get my weight. My, well, I don't have to cut much weight, honestly. I'm like, five pounds from 135 and I mean whatever I want having beer at night so I'll have to uh, you know get stationed there for a little bit and then I'll compete and then I'll come back home to uh, the States and uh, you know continue my training so I, I would never pack up and leave my teammates and my family behind maybe um, I've been his whole entire career uh, competing in Asia Japan Jakarta Manila Philippines um I, I don't need to do it, so I, I, I'll be just fine. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. I just figured, you know, so it seems like so many guys, I, I, th I think they're even talking about Misha Tate as well, uh, kind of moving her over. Yes. So. Yeah, Misha Tate is, is she's uh, she's going to be working at one championship as a commentator and a, a big uh, VP of the women. I'm not 100% sure, but she's moving over. I talked to her. Uh, you know, she, you know, she, all she has is a child and, um, uh, 
her, I think her boyfriend, I don't know if they're married yet, so she's going to go over there, she's going to also be working at the Evolve Fight Team, working on the uh, wrestling aspect of the team, so, you know, she has, you know, less, I want to say I have baggage, but I have, you know, <laughs> my family, my team. Right. I have my family, my team, and all right. that stuff, and I'm helping other teammates get ready for their fights, uh, their amateur fights, and so for me, you know, I just wanted to see, that's not my, that's not in my, uh, out of my style just to pick up and leave and go, right. go to a whole new uh, country. <laughs> right, right. Now, in, in regards to your legacy, man, what do you want this new chapter to be about, and what more would you like to accomplish? Obviously, you know, accomplish is trying to be champion. You know, when I got in it, you know, to, uh, you know, I'm going to have the same mindset. You know, obviously, deep in my heart, you know, I want to be champion. I know it's not going to be easy. It's going to be, it's probably going to be the hardest word I have to become a champion. I, I, and the reason why I say it is because now, you know, I'm a lot older, i got to take care of my body, I have a lot more, I have a lot more uh, uh, travel, I have a lot more uh, fresh competition, and w- with that being said, you know, I, when I say it's going to be a lot harder for me, so when I came into the, you know, UFC, I had no admiration to being champion. I was working a full-time job, I was just doing it for fun, and and just seeing where the ball goes. But now that I'm, like, in the groove, I'm a professional athlete, uh, I've been a champion before, and now I'm more motivated. Like, okay, let's see. Let's see. I'm motivated to go over here. I'm like, okay, let's see if I come in here, nuke on the block, and let's see if I can see how well my skill set goes, does over here. Now, I know everybody in the world is like, oh, he's going to come over here and clean the whole division. Now he's going to destroy everybody. I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think I'm going to have some wars. It's going to be a lot of battles. Um, obviously, I would love for him to be, you know, I go in there and don't get injured. But I, I can, I'm not going to, you know, say it's going to be easy walk. I know these guys over here are tough. And I know they're ready for me. I know they're ready to beat me to make a name off themselves. So I'm looking forward to the challenge and going out there and see what happens. And as far as my legacy, you don't get to pick and choose what your legacy is. The, 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 the public, the fans. They are the ones who get to pick and choose your legacy. Like for me, the biggest thing I want to make sure I'm good is that after I'm done, I'm done. Like I can retire. I can spend the rest of my life being in my kids' lives, helping out, helping people if they need help when it comes to you know uh, learning certain things or helping them get through hard times. Like just talking and tell them my story, like how I got through things. Because mixed martial arts is a tough, long road. I mean, you hear all these athletes like, and that's the thing. You know all the all the athletes, when, you know, they hear that the UFC is going to be closing the, closing the division, right, and they're all worried about what's going to happen. When they say they're going to close the division, they mean, you know what I said? To so close the motherfucking division then. I was I was ready for whatever whatever came for it. But now you see all the athletes like, and this, like I said, this was two years ago. Uh, I was ready for, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to have to bump up to, you know, the 135, I, you know, I would do it because I'm on a contract. But, um... I'm just looking forward to being able to do my best over in one championship and see where we go from there. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I guess the base, the, the summation of everything that you just said is kind of you just got to roll with the punches, go with the flow, and, and be like water, man. Pretty much. <laughs> right, right. So changing gears here before we wrap this up, and by the way, thank you for being so generous with your time this evening. Um, obviously, your big passion outside of MMA is gaming. One had announced that that uh, they would be entering the esports world, and and you would lead that charge. Uh, we talked about uh, the match made in heaven earlier. You must be ecstatic when they approached you with that idea. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I heard under uh, I heard the rumor uh, before I was I mean way before I was about to fight Henry Cejudo. I I, I heard about it. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I, and then they're like, yep. Yeah. I was like. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, well, there's, and, now, and now I was like, okay, well, you know, you guys are making big moves. You guys are, you know, jumping in. You're already in one of my passions. Now you're jumping in another one of my passions. I was like, I got to I gotta figure out how I, can, how I can get over there. And so uh, it's awesome. You know, obviously they just announced it. Uh, you know, we're going through the whole litigation of, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that have to go into play. You know, it's not like, okay, we're going to start an esports, esports company and they're gonna, we're going to have, you know, X, Y, and Z games in it. We're going to get all these teams in. There's a lot of stuff that goes 
uh, part of that, and I'm learning as as I go and as they go too. Obviously, I'm not in every single meeting or anything like that, but I was at TwitchCon. So before I went to Singapore, I had a couple uh, trips. I went to TwitchCon, I went to BlizzCon, and then I went to Singapore. And when I was in BlizzCon, I met up with one of the, the, the strategists uh, for the esports, one championship esports, and we sat down and we're talking about a whole bunch of things like what games they want to bring into, you know, under their umbrella. So it's good talks. I mean, they're in the right way. And if, I only know Chachi for a very short amount of time. And anything they, those guys get into, they go all out. So I'm looking forward to the adventure, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to see what happens. Yeah, no, another exciting part of, uh, of of this new journey for you. What level of, of involvement do you think you're going to have with that division of the company? Well, uh, as of right now, uh, it's mostly being the chief brand ambassador, making making the uh, filling that bridge, right? right? So a lot of people out there that are known as gamers are looking at nerds. I mean, you look at Sugar Sean O'Malley. Um, he, he's another guy that people who would never think that he plays video games. Like, like they all, all I think he does is play video games. But if they let the public know that, you know, as a lot of us athletes, you know, we like to come down, sit down, play video games. And, you know, as the gamers, right? Like, I was talking to the... <laughs> no, here's a funny story. I was talking to uh, the head... Uh, basically, the head dog in charge uh, in Singapore uh, athletics. Um, I forget the, uh, the gentleman's name, but we were talking, and he goes, so as chief brand ambassador, I have to ask you, how do you feel about gamers being out of shape and sit, sit down for eight hours? I was like, I think, <laughs> I think it's a problem. I, I, I told him, I straight up, I said, I think it's a problem. I know a lot of streamers and gamers who sit down for eight hours a day, and, and they're skinny fat, like, they have not an ounce of muscle in their body, and they're skinny. If you tell them to run a mile, they would take them 25 minutes, and I think that's a problem. I think if they're going to be considered, you know, a professional, uh, they, they need to have some type of form of physical uh, activity in their life, and that's something I want to bring to the table as a chief brand ambassador that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've done, you know, I, I became a world champion in mixed martial arts. I've never became a world champion in gaming, but uh, I, I gained a lot, and I like to think I have some type of idea of what those guys need to have when it comes to competing in these do tournaments. You know, some of these guys have 3,000 plus hours. Okay, well, you got 3,000 plus hours. You know, let me help you mitigate your day so you can get some type of physical activity. That way your body is not just going to flap, you know, being flabby all the fucking time. Let's get let's get a six pack. Let's get you on a great diet. You know, introducing that into the gamer's life because, you know, I don't know a lot of these guys who, who, who stream for eight to ten hours a day on Twitch and, you know, you meet them in real life and I was like, dude, like, I'm worried you're going to die of fucking diabetes or a heart attack. So, right. I, I think it's something, and that's what I told, and that's what I told him. I was like, I, I, absolutely, I would be hardcore on making sure these athletes, uh, if I have anything to say with it, that they need to have some type of physical activity. If I, if I, if I own a team, if I own, you know, an esports team, Mighty, you know, Team Mighty, there would be some form of physical activity that those guys would have to partake in. Or otherwise, they would be off the team. I'm not going to have guys, you know, obviously they'll sit down for eight to six hours a day to play their game, but it's just, it's not a healthy lifestyle. And I'm always about introducing healthy lifestyles into people's lives. Well, I think that's a brilliant idea because like you're saying, uh, you know, obviously there is uh, a big level of concern when, when, when guys are sitting there for so long. And at the same time, you kind of need to keep the, the body, mind, and you know the, the temple together and working properly in order to maybe even be better when you're when you're on there gaming and and streaming for the, for that amount of time. So uh, I think that's really cool, man. Do you think VR might be the answer to that in the future? No, 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 not, not VR. It's got to be something totally different, something totally away from the gaming, right? So right, okay, um, it, it's got to be something totally away from what you do, and that's why I love gaming so much because if you know when I when I stream and I do mixed martial arts all the time. And the last thing I want to do is come home and play a fighting game. Like, I'll play, like, Street Fighter Five and, you know, uh, SoCal Ever 6, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, but I won't go home and play UFC 3 because I just got done doing, this, you know, the same stuff in a gym with no boundaries. And so, for a gamer, if they're sitting down for 10 hours a day playing games all damn day, the last thing I'm going to do is, okay, your physical activity is throwing the VR headset, and you're just going to sit there and turn around in circles right. and jump stuff down. You're going to get outside... We're going to get together as a team, and 
we're going to play soccer. We're going we're to go play soccer with some some kids. And a lot of and then another big thing too is that a lot of these people, the streamers and the gamers, they forget how to you know intermix in with reality, like intermix with people, like go out and shake somebody's hands, go out and introduce and go out and start a conversation like, hey, my name's Demetrius Johnson. What are you passionate about? What brings you to this event? You know? Oh, right, you a, loss a, of, a loss you know, of social you, skills, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the social skills, you know, like how to spit games to a girl, like, oh, wow, you, you have very beautiful hair. And then she goes, what's so beautiful about it? Like, boom, you got to be able to follow up. Like, you know, well, I've always been a big fan of, you know, blonde, blonde hair, and I, I love how you have the ombre, you know, look going on right now. I think that's, I think I'm on the right track with that. <laughs> you know, I haven't been game in almost 12 to 13 years, so I'm a little rusty, but I like to think, you know, for being in the game for 13 years, I still got a, a whip, a whiplash tongue. <laughs> By the way, man, uh, how, how freaking cool is it to see a fight in VR? I saw you with the headset there. Th that's pretty awesome. Do you think that could be the future of watching fights? Yes, 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 yes. Now, that's a totally different thing. So, that was an amazing experience. Uh, it, it's something that one championship is working on. Um, and I, I can't remember who the, the company is who's doing it, but uh, one championship, they had a big boxing fight, WBC World Championship. Uh, I think it was in China. I'm not sure. Don't quote me. And watching it, and that was basically my view. And the cool thing I liked about it was that you're literally inside, you know, the ring, and I was able to, you know, look, and I'll look to the left, and I'll see Matt. <laughs> I'll see Matt at his station. You look to the right, you see Chatri, you see the ring girls. And the cool thing about it was I was able to look at the footwork of the boxer, and one of the guys was a softball, and he kept getting out of the outside lead leg. So it could be great for watching film, breaking down film, and just the whole viewing aspect as well. Now it would be weird if you're at home by, you know, with a full house of dudes and you're the only dude who has a headset on. Right, but it'd be yeah. cool if you're at the house and everybody and their mom has a headset on. It's like, wow, this is an interesting way to watch the, you know, uh, the fights. It's just giving you another way to watch the fight. Yeah, and you make a great point as far as reviewing tape and studying an opponent. That could be very beneficial for uh, you guys that are actually in the game, but that's really cool stuff. Listen, man, Demetrius, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I hope you feel the same way. Uh, in conclusion, my friend, what would you say to all the fans out there that are eagerly awaiting your one championship debut? What can they all expect when you finally return to action? Yeah, man, obviously do yourself a favor. Go to your app store, Android Android store, Google Play store, the uh, iPhone app store, download the one super app. It's free. You basically, I don't believe you log in. There's no password login or anything. Get that. And uh, right now I'm training. About to go in the gym right now. I haven't decided if I'm going to spar today or do my geek grappling. Uh, I'm training hard, trying to get uh, my body back to 100% healthy. And uh, let, let's see how well we can do in this uh, flyweight tournament. Awesome, man. Anything you think we missed? Any shout-outs, sponsor plugs? The floor is yours, bro. Yeah, you know, shout-out to my uh, sponsor, Zevia. Shout-out to uh, Evolve Fight Team in Singapore. Thank you to all my coaches. Uh... Matt Hume, Brad Curtis, and uh, my teammates, and uh, onto a new adventure, man. Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. All the future has in store for you. It is definitely a bright future indeed. Um, again, hopefully we can catch up uh, when something gets announced. You have a fantastic Thanksgiving, my friend. You do the same, buddy. Hope you guys enjoyed our conversation with Mighty Mouse. First time having him on the show. Absolute pleasure to to speak with him. And of course, as I said in the interview, he has a very bright future with one championship, not only in combat sports, but also with his other passion of gaming. Very cool stuff. But let's keep it rolling. BJPenn.com Radio, the fighter's voice. Coming up next, Yancey Medeiros. All right, Penn Nation, please welcome back to the show, Hawaiian warrior, fan favorite, gritty scrapper, a man we enjoy having on the show time and time again, Yancey Medeiros. Aloha, Yancey. Thanks, as always, for taking the time to speak with us today, man. How you doing, brother? What's up, brothers? I'm I'm doing good, bro. Just I've been training in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> I've been training in the jungle, bro. Putting in the work on the daily, as always. Hell yes, yes. Very good. Now, last time we spoke, it was just before the Mike Perry fight. Uh, you were about to leave for fight week, and, and everything was looking good. Then it was like the next day, or maybe two days later... The news broke that you had uh, you had the injured rib and you had to pull out of the fight. What happened from there on, man? From the last time we spoke, um, I was I was real I was real 
butt hurt about that fight, man. I was, I mean, the, about you know not being able to fight that um that fight just because I had a rib injury and like I never, you know, I never really. I was looking forward to it. I felt like this is the best, you know, this is the best Yancey people are gonna see. I was just so down pat, like I was on, I was on motion. And as soon as I got that injury and I went to the doctor, in fact, I talked to you that day. I was talking to you, right? The, the last time I talked to you, the I injury went, happened that day. Uh, that day, I went. Well, I had the injury, but I, I mean, like, I ain't no bitch, you know. So I went to the doctors, I had the interview, and after that, I went to the doctors, freaking. And it came out. I had a broken rib, oh, a, a man. fractured, a fractured rib, and it was. It still, it still pokes out. But I mean, it's hundred percent. But you can tell that my rib was fucked up. <laughs> you know, like it's not like I, I was like I was real bummed about it. I had a lot of expectations. I had a lot of expectations, man. You know what they say? Like I really was looking forward to the real, the a better Yancey, and you know that just fucking that just made me even grind even more. You know, I got that. I hit that. I hit that wall, and I broke my rib. And I was like, "Shit, man!" You know, if I really want this, I'm gonna have to fucking. I'm gonna have to grind again because I was down. I was real butt hurt about that. So about not being able to fight. How how did it happen? Was it a wrestling thing? Was it somebody I was cracking in the rib? Or? I was in jujitsu and I was doing on adrenaline, and then just yeah, after practice, I was like, "What the hell?" I couldn't breathe. Like every time I try and inhale, I'd get a sharp pain in the front and the back and I'm like what so I was like maybe if I'll maybe I sleep it off it'll be all right maybe I got a rib out or something you know like because I never I never broke anything in my life I've right. dislocated my thumb but I've never broke anything yeah. you know I've seen shit so I don't I didn't understand what's going on I was just like I live by a warrior code like you know I ain't no bitch so I was just like fuck let's see if I sleep it off and go and then nothing changed Right, so so being that you've never broken anything, it was an unfamiliar feeling for you to even say, "Oh yeah, my ribs broken." You had no idea. No, not even. Like I was just like, I couldn't even. Like, I had a hard time taking off my fucking shirt and shit. They had to do it slow, and I was just like, "What is this? Is this a sprain, a bruise, like you know, whatever?" And then you know, I didn't understand what it was, and everyone's like, "Ah, it's all right. It's probably a rib out." And I was like, "Cool." But then the next morning, I was like, "Still same pain. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing relieved." You know, and I was like, "I gotta go doctors check it out." Well, like you were saying, I, I know you were really disappointed and, you know, not being able to go out for that match that, you know, everyone, including yourself, myself, anybody I know that's a true fight fan, they were excited for that fight. Oh, bro. I think I was way more excited for that fight than, than any other fans were. Right. <laughs> I was so, just because, not because of who I was fighting, but because I was going to, I felt, I was, like I said, I was expecting to see the best Yancey in that octagon. Not for everyone else, but for me. Right. You know, like that's that's a downfall when you get expectations and things don't happen. Of course, of course. So, well, what uh, you know, obviously that's in the rear view now. You're looking ahead, but I'm wondering what was the recovery process like for you? And it sounds like you're back to training full time now. Bro, I'm gonna be straight up. I started training in the I started training in the fucking jungle. <laughs> Seriously, man. Like, just I'm fucking. I, I, I got set. After that fight, I got injured, I recovered, and I was like, no, I'm on one. I was on Drake shit, bro. Like, I wasn't <laughs> stopping this. You know what I mean? I was like, I was, I'm too passionate about being a martial artist, and shit happens. You know I mean, shit, shit doesn't happen. Shit, shit doesn't happen to you. Shit just happens. That's, that's a good way to look at it, man. Right? right, it doesn't happen to you. Shit just happens. And that's how I took it. And I fucking woke up. I fucking... And I'm just, like I said, bro, woke up, went to the jungle, and I'm on fucking gorilla shit. So, <laughs> I'm so. I'm fucking on the, I'm on, bro, I'm swinging from tree to tree. They said they, the, the lion's the king of the jungle. Ain't no fucking lions in the jungle, bro. I've been training there. Out there getting gorilla savage been like swinging, Tarzan. Bro. The, the, I've seen tigers. I ain't seen no lions, bro. <laughs> ain't no, that ain't the king of the jungle. Fucking, I've been training there, bro. I'm, I'm dead serious, bro. I am on gorilla shit. So, obviously, you know, like I said, you're looking ahead now. You recently said, or announced rather, that you'd be moving back to lightweight. Uh, you're currently looking for a matchup. First off, man, tell us about the decision to move back to lightweight. How did that all come about? Well, like I said, I, I, like, like I said, bro, I just, I, after my injury, I fucking woke up. Fucking, bro, I was on, I was on Bruce Lee shit, bro. I was just like, nah, I ain't, ain't going to get bitter about this because I was bitter. I was fucking bitter that I had to pull out of that fight, you know? And I was like, nah, I ain't going to be bitter. I live up to my motto, get better, not bitter. 
You know, and it just, and that's what, that, and it just clicked. I, I clicked, I fucking started just fucking, like I said, like, I can't even, I can't even collaborate it, man. Like, I literally went back to fucking, I evolved back to being a gorilla, bro. I fucking weak like a gorilla. Like, I'm, I didn't even know how to fucking start that shit, bro. I literally feel like that. Like, fucking, I'm on that, I'm on that wave, bro. Like, they can't, they can't, nothing's gonna stop me from getting there. I'm already 170. Right. You know, well, like, I'm, I'm training, I'm training so hard, bro. I'm training so hard to not even, I'm getting to 155 whether UFC is gonna accept that or not. They didn't even know I was doing that shit because that's just shit. That's just what I'm doing. Right. Like, I'm gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, you gotta stay 170. No, I'm going to 155 and I'm gonna show you guys. If you guys need me, if you need this 155er to fight a 170, then so be it. I ain't telling you I ain't gonna fight no 170. I just letting everybody know this gorilla is going to 155. So it sounds to me, man, like obviously, again, it was a setback, but all of this, when it's all said and done, this has been a blessing in disguise for you. It's really motivated you again. Oh, bro, like I said, man, shit don't happen to you. It just happens, and it fucking woke me up, bro. Right. It literally woke me up, man, and just fucking drink shit, right? I keep repeating myself, <laughs> drink shit. I'm on one. <clears throat> now, I, I, I know it's never been a huge my movement. I know it's never been a huge issue for you. Uh, but you know, you're comfortable going back to, to, to a serious weight cut like that? Or you feel, you're feeling like you're in the type of shape where the weight cut back to 155 isn't even going to be a big issue for you. Hey bro, remember when I said gorilla shit? Right. I'm on that level where this gorilla ain't going to even cut weight. Wow. I promise you that. I'm on that. That's how, that's how good. That's how, that's how good I got it, bro. That's how much I'm on this shit. Silver back, back. Like, I'm literally going to be there, bro. You watch, follow me. Follow my journey, bro. Because I'm telling you, I'm be in the jungle and I'm making that weight. I'm going to be 160 before I even need to be. I'm going to be 155 before I even need to be 155. And I'm going to stay at that weight and I'm going to coast there. And I'm going to fucking fight whoever I need to fight. And that and that's the ideal situation, right? Is that you that you get down to a weight where you're, <clears throat> you're walking around at it. So when you finally get in there, I mean, there is no issue... You're ready to go. There is no draining yourself. You're trying to get to 155 as a walk around weight for you and stay in that shape year round. Yeah, you know I ain't got no none of these cuts. I'm gonna stay at 155 just in case that 165 comes up. And if it doesn't, I'm still there for a 170. Right. You know I never said to anyone that I ain't fighting at Walter weight. I just said that I'm going down to 155. So at this point, whatever, at this point, whatever. you've got three options on the table. If they open up the 165, that interests you. You're going to take a fight at 155, and you're still open to welterweight as well. Most definitely. Awesome, man. So yeah, I ain't got no cut. Right, right. <laughs> so th- jumping ahead here, you've mentioned it a few times already. Uh, you've talked about it quite a bit on social media. Weak like a gorilla. Where did that come from? <laughs> Weak like a gorilla, bro. Look into it with Eddie Bravo. <laughs> oh, no, you ever, <laughs> you ever, you ever seen a weak gorilla? <laughs> I know exactly where you're going. All right, cool, man. Exactly, exactly, bro. Exactly. There's layers to it, but you ever seen one? Because I haven't. No, I'm swinging they... from tree to tree, bro, and that's my flow. Right, they don't exist. Weak gorillas don't survive, man. Bro, exactly. Right, so. Obviously, you're feeling like a gorilla looking to show 155 who the alpha is, right? Yes. I'm, I'm, I want to be at the top, bro. You know what I mean? Like, this is all it is. Like, I don't care who it is. You, you're asking me what, what matchups make sense. Any 155, top 10. That's it. You know, so, I don't call people out. I don't know if you've seen that post. I don't call people out, but I'm ready for that pullout. Right, so you're you're looking to maybe be a last minute replacement and save the day here and and go in there and uh. Hey, last last minute replacement, first first uh, first choice, second second choice, last choice. If you want fifty five and you're ready, well, on the table. Put it on the table. My manager knows what's up. UFC knows what's up. I'm ready for anybody. Right, man. Well, I'm. I'll tell you what, I man. I need to get booked. I need to get booked yesterday. Right. Right. I am. When do I want to get booked? I want to. My return date needs to be yesterday. So, uh, I, I mean, obviously, you got to be realistic about it. But I mean, is there an event or a or a card in particular you've got in mind, or you're just going to be looking at any options, any and all options? You're you're I'm, open. I'm to? ready. I'm ready for any option, but I love to get on those January cards. I like. I love to fight on the end of the year card. 
I'd love to fight on January. That'd be dope too. You know what I mean? It's just I ain't get no. I I haven't had no um, fight notices in the past couple of weeks. So I was like, Psh, I'm moving down to 55. I ain't got no 170s ready to fight. I'm going to 55. Okay, let's go. Whole new class of way more people. Absolutely, 170 seems to be pretty gridlocked at the moment. But you you know you're absolutely right. There's a lot more exciting matchups too for you at 155. Um, when you look at the landscape of the division, man, I, I know you're not into calling anybody out, but you know, what, what matchup would you be most excited for? Who would get you really, really hyped up to go out there and compete against? Top 10. Top 10 guys is getting me hyped up, bro. I don't get hyped up for any 155. I ain't got no, like I said, I ain't got no call-offs, bro. Give me them top 10. I'll, 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 I'll gladly fill in for, for, for whoever Justin Gates, Ian Perez. Like, I just need, I need to amplify, I, I, who am I to be calling out anybody? I call out everybody. Right. Because, you know, I'm going back to this weight cut. So I, I don't need to call out anybody. I call out everybody. Right. Because, obviously, I need to prove myself right while this gorilla is ready to bang. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, man. I love the mindset. It sounds like you're real fired up, and I'm definitely looking forward to this return. But changing gears here for a moment, we mentioned uh, social media a couple minutes ago, Week Like a Gorilla. You've also been posting about getting back to flowing. What did you mean by that? Do you mean like flowing in the training room or just rolling with the punches in life in general? Uh, just, it's, it's everything. Flow. Get that flow state. You know what I mean? Like, be like you water. Ever see a, yeah, be like water, but you know what I mean? You ever seen a fucking gorilla be all stiff and shit? You see him swinging from tree to tree, you're fucking, you know what I mean? That fucking smooth. It's right. flowing. There ain't no, there ain't no. That's what it is. I'm, I'm in there physically, mentally, emotionally, fucking spiritually. I'm in there, bro. You guys are going to see a whole fucking different young team of theirs. Man. I feel happy. I love everybody, bro. But I am, like I said, for the hundredth time, I'm fucking on one, bro. I'm on that Drake shit. <laughs> and you're like, you're fucking ready. Well, I'm I'm hyped for it, man. And you got you got me all fired up over here. But uh, listen, yeah. you, yeah. you, you've been more than generous with your time. I just got a couple more questions here for you. Before we wrap this up, you know I got to ask about some upcoming fights. First with your homie Nick Diaz, man. What do you think about this announced matchup against Jorge Masvidal? Two real motherfuckers. Two of the realest fighters I know. But I know Nick. Nick's my homeboy. That's my. That's the general of the group. You know what I mean? I'm always gonna pay my homage. That's always. I'm always Team Nick. When it's taken away from the fighting, coming to the fucking knowing what's up, Masvidal is. He's cool. He's cool as a man. As cool. That guy's a real Cuban. I'm a real Hawaiian. He's a real Cuban. I know that shit. Right. I, he don't need to tell me. He don't need to tell me that, bro. I just see it right in his eyes. You know what I mean? I just you real. It's all good. I respect that to the utmost. That's gonna be a real fight. But that ain't no question whose side I'm. I'm, I'm on. Right. Right. Of course. Of you know, course. You know what I mean? There ain't no question on that, baby. Nick Diaz Academy 100. But I got the utmost respect for Masvidal. He's one of the. He's one of my. He's one of the most realest fighters out there. I agree with you 100%, man. And uh, obviously, I obviously you go with your your, your boy Nick, but uh, I'm I'm happy to hear that you have that same sentiment that everybody else does that that fight is going to be a scrap, and it's the one that Nick has really needed all this time. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Nick don't like fighting athletes, and Masvidal is not no athlete. There's a difference. There's tears to this shit, right? And fucking Masvidal, he's a fight. Nick loves that shit. That's what we all strive off of. You gonna bring that brings the best out of all of us. That's why I pick with Nick. <laughs> right, he's a scrapper. M- Masvidal's a scrapper. Nick's a scrapper, and we're gonna get an amazing fight when they finally lock horns. I agree with you there, man. Uh, and as Hell for yeah. as for your right hand man, Max Holloway, we're getting closer to his fight with Brian Ortega. How is he looking? And give us your thoughts on that matchup. Fucking beautiful, beautiful. This is the best match you guys gonna see, bro. Like, honestly. Like, you think I'm on one? Watch it, fucking Max Holloway comes in. Put it this way, man. I'm just happy. This, this, bro, Max, this is the best Max anyone's gonna see, bro. Mentally, physically. Just, I'm just happy to call him my brother and training partner. Put right. it that way. I'm privileged, bro, to, to see this process, to see him go through this, to, 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 to just see his. To just see everything change for him and fucking be ready for this fight. I have the utmost respect for Brian Ortega, too. But Brian, my boy, is fucking coming. Like, I know Brian. He's cool. He's much respect, but like, this is war. And I'm just letting everybody know that fucking Max Holloway is coming. 
right? And, and it's got to feel good to evolve as a martial artist alongside your brother like that too, right? Oh, bro, that's the thing. We never stop evolving every day. We're, uh, I'm on a level with Maxwell. Every time we step on that mat and we train, we fucking got better. Every time. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's on this level. We live in Hawaii. We don't be, we don't be flying people in to go train and special, special sparring partners. We utilize everybody around who we got. In the mainland, everybody got everybody. They got guys they don't know coming training. In Hawaii, everybody know everybody. You know what I mean? So it's a different type of tenacity. It's a different type of system that you have to find when it comes to fighting with people. Right? right. Like, we're, we're, right? You know what I'm saying? We're on a small island. We got, you guys in, whoever's in California got Vegas, Arizona, got all this, Florida. It's just, you got fucking, you know what I mean? 48, 47 or a lot of states to go and train at with different people that don't give a fuck about you. Right. They have way more experience. Hawaii don't got that, but you know what? We found a fucking formula, and you're going to see that December 8th, and you're going to see that when this gorilla gets in that octagon. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you, you get me fired up, man. But listen, um, yeah. just to stay on yeah, Max for a moment. I ain't no snitch. I just let you know what's going down, though. The fucking <laughs> wave is coming. Tsunami. Tsunami wave, baby. All right, so listen. All that talks of Max dying, having seizures during the weight cut, last time his fight was booked. Was there any truth to that? I'm sure you're confident that he's doing just fine, and we're going to see the best blessed going forward. We're going to see the best blessed going forward, but I definitely, I've definitely seen Max weak, but I've never seen him like that. And from what I know, when he's trained, he got back to Hawaii, he was all 100 with getting back to training in a, in a progressive way. You know, it took him. It took some time after the fight got called off for him to be to feel natural again. But he took tests and he just went back to you know being healthy. And everything was fortunate. I was glad. I was like, hell yeah! I don't give a fuck what happened as long as you're healthy. Yeah, I mean, I don't care what anybody said. Max ain't no bitch. Of course I don't give not. A fuck what anybody said. You oh, he pulled out. He's scared. He's seizure, blah blah blah. Whatever. I don't care, bro. But all I care about is Max's health, and he came back 100 mentally, emotionally. Right, and that, and then again, that lends itself to the camaraderie you guys have. You know, he's your brother. You're looking out for his best interest. But for all those doubters, December eighth is coming quickly. We're certainly going to find out soon. December eighth, you will see the best Max Holloway. Now, are you gonna are you gonna be with him uh, for fight week? I, would, or? Uh, I, I mean, you know what? I'll be with him fight week if there's a pullout. Because <laughs> 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 if not, I'm training. You know right. what I mean? I gotta stay ready. I'm staying ready because this dude, this gorilla ain't getting ready. All right. Well, listen, man. I'm certainly looking forward to both these fights we just mentioned, and especially your return. Again, man, you you got me hyped up over here. Uh, what would you say to any of those lightweights out there that that might be looking for a matchup, or if somebody pulls out, what would you do to encourage somebody to take a fight against you? What would I do to encourage someone to take a fight against? Me? Hey, if you ain't on, if you ain't trying to get to the top, get the fuck out of here. You know, there's, I've always been trying to do that, and that's why I don't call people out because I try to get to the top. If number one was ready for a fight, they're like, "Yes, we gonna fight." That's what I was training for. I'm not going, I'm not pulling out on anything. So who's ever, whoever's ready to fight me, whoever's ready to fight this gorilla, please come through. Simple enough, my friend. And for all the fans out there, what what can they expect when you finally make that return? Yancey Medeiros returns to action maybe late 2018, early 2019. What can all your fans and exporters, supporters of, uh, expect when you finally get back out there? Uh, nothing different. Just a sharper, better Yancey Medeiros that always brings it. All right, man. I'm over here. I ain't over here to feel cards. I'm over here to feel seats. That's a you good way I mean? to look I at it, man. I ain't over here to be card replacement. I'm over here. I know what I'm in the octagon to do. I'm over there to feel seats up. And hey, man, your fighting style speaks for itself, so there's no problem doing that anytime you step into action. But listen, man, anything you think we missed, any shout-outs, sponsor plugs before we let you go, the floor is yours, brother. Nah, nah yeah, I mean, thanks for shooting it out. I always like kicking it, chopping it up with you, man. Always uh, always a thanks pleasure. For me, thanks for letting me get out my fucking this movement. This gorilla is coming. Gorilla shit, Jay. Gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> Silverback is back, baby. Silverback. Back 100. See? You man, bro. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, Yancey. Always a pleasure. We'll catch up again soon. Hopefully something gets announced. And until then, man, safe travels and have a great Thanksgiving, bro. All right, my brother. Happy Thanksgiving. Aloha. Aloha, Aloha brother. Mahalo. Thank you.
Peace. Weak like a gorilla. Very cool stuff from Yancey. Hope you guys enjoyed our conversation with him. I always have a blast when Yancey comes on. And make sure you guys keep an eye out for his next fight. As you heard there, the man sounds motivated. But let's keep it moving like we always do. BJPenn.com radio, the fighter's voice. Coming up next, one championship featherweight, Gary Tonin. All right, Penn Nation, please welcome back to the show. Coming off yet another impressive victory at one Heart of the Lion last weekend in Singapore. The Lion Killer himself, Gary Tonin. Thanks as always for joining us, Gary. I'd imagine that you're already back home coaching per the norm. <laughs> yeah, man. Try to jump right back into it. Um, you know, I just we just went to uh, to Henzo's. Uh, John's not back yet, um, so you know we're, we're all just kind of you know working together to coach. Uh, Gordon was coaching today. Um, I uh, I've been sitting in traffic in the snow since about 3 p.m. and it's about 6:30 now. I still haven't gotten back home. A ride that usually takes around an hour and a half with traffic and stuff like that is now about three hours or more. So <laughs> Right, so you, you got cabin fever, but in a car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's always terrible, my friend. But listen, before we jump into the fight, recap the fight, I got to know, did you end up having some Stingray? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We got some Stingray out there for sure. Love it. Awesome, very good. It was good. spicy at the place we went to get it this time. Wow, awesome, man. Very good. Now, you called it on the show last time we spoke. You said that you visualized a second-round submission. That's exactly how it went. Are you happy with that performance? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy with that, the way things went down. I mean, the funny part is is that I said that there would probably be a second-round TKO or a submission because uh, I thought that he was going to continuously try to force the fight to the ground, but it really didn't end up working out that way. I don't really think he intended on trying to do anything on the ground, to be honest. Uh, I think... I think if it was his choice, he would have just tried to keep the fight standing the whole time. Uh, it's like I said, I, I, I kind of, I'm done like planning for people because <laughs> every time they fight against me, they do something a little different because obviously I'm a little bit of a different opponent. Um, so, yeah, I think he wanted to keep it standing. I did too, honestly. Uh, the only thing I'm disappointed about is I wish I could have continued to stay standing, you know, till towards the end of the fight. Uh, the thing is just, you know, I got caught underneath the eye. They were looking at it like, pretty seriously after the first round and it didn't even look that I didn't feel that bad to me you know um but it made me nervous enough that like you know once it opened up in the second round I just wanted to finish the fight as soon as possible so I felt like I got a good amount of standing experience this fight uh and I did I think a noticeable improvements from the previous fights um and you know obviously still won and didn't get you know uh stopped for blood or anything like that so I mean all's well man I'm pretty happy with what went on Absolutely. So that that's interesting. So it sounds to me like they were, uh, I mean, I, I saw the highlights of the fight. I, I didn't see the the in between the rounds there, but they were looking at that cut. There was a possibility of it being stopped. So you felt the desperation to go in there and get the finish in the second. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was gonna keep things standing from the initial cut because I knew the initial cut wasn't that bad. Um, but then I think he hit it again in the second round, and then it opened up. I could feel blood pouring down my cheek. And then when that happened, I was like, ah, I'm not going to take any chances. Right. So I, it, wasn't, it wasn't my immediate intention second round. I actually said to John, like, hey, man, do you mind if I keep uh, staying standing? And he said, yeah, you're doing great. So, um, you know, I was going to try to stay doing that, but, yeah. Right. Well, he, he was absolutely correct, man. Your striking looked good. Last time we spoke, you had mentioned that you uh, feel as though you're evolving in the striking department and getting more comfortable on your feet. You landed some good jabs, good kicks including a very nice leg kick in the first round, some great knees as well. And on top of all that, man, you switch stances quite a bit, which in my opinion is a sign of a developed striker. Sure. I mean, to a certain degree. I mean, it could go both ways. I mean, I think some people, you know, like myself, especially at the beginning, it's just like early on, I would do it like kind of naively. Uh, I think I still do some, you know, make little mistakes here and there when it comes to switching stance. Um, You know, a lot of people criticize it. I, I think a lot of things is, a lot of the issue is it's just not what people are used to also. Right. You know, um, when it comes to switching stances, there's very few people that are, uh, there's very few people that are comfortable doing it. There's very few people that are proficient with it. So, like, when it comes to coaching and when it comes to people's advice, a lot of people tend to, like, not really, you know, uh, have good things to say about switching stances too, too often. Um, so I get a lot of criticism for that most of the time. But I, I really feel like... Uh, I really feel like in the grand scheme of things, it's going to help me out um, to be able to be able to fight on both sides 
depending upon what my training partner is going to be doing, or sorry, what my opponent's going to be doing, I think it just makes you a little bit more versatile, uh, makes you a little bit more unpredictable as well. So I'm going to continue doing that. I don't really have, I don't really have a reason to just stick with one stance. Right, and I mean, at the same time, if it's working for you, it's working for you, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel with everything. You know, I feel like if you're doing a good job of hitting and not getting hit, I mean, you know, what's the harm? Right, so, right. Honestly, man, in just your third fight in MMA, I think you look like a guy who's been striking for years. Like I said, you seem to be very, very comfortable in there. Uh, but I'm wondering, did Lee do anything in there that surprised you at all? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say surprised me. It's like I said, like I kind of stopped trying to read people because I feel like they react so different um, to fighting me or uh, than than like the way that they fight their previous opponents. So, like, I mean. Going in there, I would have expected him, based on what he'd done previously, to just constantly try to bring the fight to the ground. But since, you know, I, I'm guessing he respected my jiu-jitsu, he decided that that wasn't what he was going to do. So I wouldn't necessarily say it was a surprise, but it definitely was different than what he, do, what he did in, in many of his other fights. Um, so and other than that, I mean, he's just he's a really tough, durable dude. I pretty much expected that uh, from the fact that from his previous fight with Amir Khan, like Amir was clearly a better striker, um, but he was still uh, Lee was still able to kind of walk Amir into the fence multiple times. Like he was able to back him up just by keeping his you know his chin tucked and uh, and he would throw punches over the top that that would land. You know, so um, even though he was getting landed on a lot, like you know, it's it's pretty easy for him to just push forward, um, just staying relatively defensively sound and uh, and continuing to throw in combinations. That was one of the things that I, I noticed most with, with Lee was, you know, if I would come forward and I would land some punches um, while I was looking to, like, avoid getting hit, he was always throwing a lot of punches in combinations. So it wasn't very easy to just kind of come forward, miss one shot, and then keep throwing my own combinations. I always kind of had a lot to look out for uh, as I was coming forward. So it wasn't as easy to just, you know, mow, mow through him with the striking, you know. Right, right. So on top of uh, him kind of deviating from the game plan you were expecting with taking you down, looking for the takedown, he was also a pretty durable guy. Yeah, yeah. Overall, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it just, uh, it just, it, it's, it, it ends up being, you know, good for me because, like I said, you know, otherwise he would have just like fell to the floor after a, a couple strong punches or kicks. Right. Um, and he stayed standing, so it made it more fun, you know, in terms of trying to do the stand up stuff. Right. More, the more repetitions in there, the better for you at the end of the day. Sure. Uh, how did it feel competing at 155 in mixed martial arts? I know you had mentioned in your last fight that, you know, you felt much smaller than your opponent. How did it feel yeah. competing at 155? Yeah, it felt great, man. You know, I would like to try to stay there as, uh, for as long as I can. They have a lot of really good prospects at 170, so um, there's a good chance, like, you know, I'll end up fighting uh, guys at that weight at some point, you know, whether it's Shinya or Eddie or whoever, you know, like at 170. Um, they got a lot of, you know, really good guys that are like big matchups for them. So I'm sure I'll, people will see me fighting at 70 again. Um, it's just, I think in the meantime, uh, I'll be fighting at 155 and, uh, you know, maybe I'll try, they have a lightweight Grand Prix that's going on right now with a lot of their top guys. So my, my thought process is, is that if that's an eight man Grand Prix, so that's a minimum of three fights that they'd all be having. Uh, or that the, that it would take to win the whole thing, so that whole process would take roughly like a little less than a year. So if that's the case, a lot of the guys that are going to be involved with that are going to be be hung up for a little while. So you know, I'm thinking I'll, I'll have a pretty good shot at potentially getting uh, you know that 155 pound title at some point. Now looking ahead, you told me that you wanted to be on on the card in Japan, but you also wanted to compete again before March. Have you spoke to the promotion about fighting again in January, or are you yeah, going to be looking I to doing the sub only instead? I have, man. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen the way they made it sound. Like they already kind of filled up the card for January, and I could do something February, but the only thing they have in February is mid February. So I, I think that's too close to the March show. You know, if they want me to be healthy and everything like that, right? Uh, I think it would be taking a pretty big risk to have a fight in February. So, I mean, if they can jump me on to something late January, awesome. It doesn't sound like they're going to. Um, if there's something grappling available in the meantime, I'd be happy to do it. But, uh, you know, again, like I said, it's got uh, to be worth it. We've got to find something, uh, something exciting, somebody that's, uh, 
you know, that's that's tough and that people are going to give a damn about me, you know, grappling against, you know. Now, would you be willing to be a, a last-minute replacement for a fight if somebody falls out? Yeah, that's what I tried to talk to them about. They never got back to me on that. So that's kind of what I was thinking, too, is maybe trying to be some, a replacement or just be on uh, on call. Right. Um, just, you know, stay in shape and everything. Um, but they haven't gotten back to me about that, but that was my second suggestion as well. Right. Now, last time we spoke, <clears throat> we had discussed the, the signing of Eddie Alvarez. I know you guys are connected through Henzo, but, you know, I've got to ask. You mentioned 170, 155, depending on what weight class he ends up competing at, at uh, in the company. Uh, if you guys are in the same division, are you open to fighting him? You know, there's a high likelihood that he becomes the champion in whichever division you, you choose to be uh, competing in. Yeah, I would imagine that we would. I mean, we don't, like, directly train together. Like, we never we never actually have. Um, so I don't really see much of an issue with it. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not looking to, like, try to step on anybody's toes, you know, r- right away, like I said. Like, you know, I, especially, I, he won't be fighting at 155. Like, he's he's way too big for that, in my opinion. I, I could be wrong. I could be dead wrong. But, I mean, I think this weight cut, like, making it twice. You have to make weight twice in a row and be hydrated twice in a row. Like, it's tough, man. It's not, like... It's not like an easy 155, like what he's used to doing with UFC, where you can cut 30 pounds in a day. You know, right. like it's just it's just a different story. So, I mean, who knows? But I think it's a high likelihood that he stays at 170. Um, and you know, like I said, they got a lightweight Grand Prix and things going on. You know, it's going to be a while before we see that fight happening. Um, but I definitely think that it, it could potentially be in the cards in the future. And it's something that I, of course, would look forward to, considering the fact that he's a UFC veteran and. Um, you know, very, very well known in the mixed martial arts world. So obviously, you know, having that fight is a very high profile, uh, fight. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, nobody's directly told me like, you know, that it's not going to happen or anything like that. So, uh, as far as I know, I would see us fighting at some point. Yeah. And the beauty of it too, is there would be a ton of mutual respect. It'd be a very exciting fight for the fans. And like you said, he's got a huge name behind him. It would be great for your brand to go out there and compete against a guy like that. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, of course. And, you know, with one, like, everything is kept super uh, respectful and everything as well. You know, like, they're an organization they talk they talk about and they uh, not just talk about it, but they, they show value uh, in terms of, like, the actual martial arts. So it's not like, you know, we're going to be trying to shit talk each other or whatever the case may be. There's right. going to be some sort of grudge. You know, of course, it's fighting's fighting. A fight's a fight. But, um, you know, I'm not like – it's not going to be like a – what you see where two guys are pitted against each other in UFC and they got to, you know, trash talk them each other to death. Right. So it's not like, you know, I don't think there's going to be any bad blood there if that, that fight does happen. You know? Yeah. You and I discussed that extensively last time. And, and, and again, it is very refreshing to see, but we had also talked about the signing of mighty mouse as well. Uh, but then on fight week, the news broke that Misha Tate would be joining the company in an executive position. What was your reaction yeah. to that news? Well, that was interesting, you know, I mean, I'm happy for her coming over, you know, I think they're a really great work organization to work for, so, like, if that's if that's the route that she's going, like, if she's kind of, like, done fighting, or, I don't know, maybe she'll be a, do a super fight in the future, who knows, but, um, you know, if she kind of, like, wants to go the route of, like, working for a, a fight organization, like, I definitely think one is, uh, is a really good way to go, because, uh, I mean, like I said, like, all of my interactions with anybody that's ever worked for one have been super positive. Uh, it seems like all the people that are involved like work together pretty well. Um, so I think she's going to enjoy it. Uh, Singapore is going to be an interesting move for her and her family. I don't know right. if she's ever been out to that part of the world before. That's the only thing that I might worry about. It's just like, you know, like the weather is very, uh, very different. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're literally, I mean, I, I personally would love to live there. Uh, you know, we just got to get John to agree to it but <laughs> I go wherever he goes as far as I'm concerned but like it's very like hot and humid because it's like right on the equator Singapore you know so uh, that'll be interesting her getting used to that I think that'll be the hardest part of the whole the whole switch I think everything else will be cake you know everything else she'll she'll appreciate it um, and uh, yeah again you know good to have another uh, you know experienced uh, you know female mixed martial artist involved in uh, in the organization as well you know, I'm sure that'll be a good look in terms of, uh, you know, the other uh, female talent in, in the organization. So For sure, for sure. Now, Misha had told one of our guys who was in Singapore last week, uh, 
that she sees a power shift happening in MMA right now. Do you agree with her? I mean, based on what's been happening so far, I would definitely agree. I mean, they've been, they signed a lot of really big name guys, um, you know, really quickly. This has been happening. I saw that, uh, you know, they were in talks with Sage Northcutt as well. He came down to, the, to watch the fights. Yeah, he was um, present, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, those are a lot of big names, you know, being signed relatively quick. Um, you know, I'm, I have pretty, pretty big confidence in uh, the organization as well as, as Chatri and, and their, uh, you know, and their ability to continue to grow. Um, that's all I've seen since I, since before I joined one and since I've joined is just growth, uh, climbing up and up and up and up. So I really don't see any downturn happening anytime soon. I mean, from starting as a relatively small organization, they've, they've grown so much, uh, you know, since they started, it's, it's really crazy to see. And now I think we're, we're on an even bigger upswing, um, than previous, so uh, I'm super excited to see all the all the new stuff stuff that's going to come to the table. I mean, when I was talking to, to John about all this, you know, this is kind of like a wild card that we didn't see. You know, absolutely. Uh, it's not like anybody. It's not like anybody's been talking to us. You know, for the last like six months, like, hey, yeah, we're going to sign like Demetrius and Eddie Alvarez. <laughs> like, you know, like that was not nobody. Nobody knew that. I knew that. You know, when everybody else knew it, it's not like one has been telling us about that so uh it was like a bonus you know that these guys are coming over to the organization because it brings a lot more attention even you know even if i didn't get those fights you know what i mean uh it brings a lot of attention to the organization um regardless and just notoriety in general because uh they're such high caliber fighters of course of course and all that considered it must make you only feel more confident that one was the right choice for you yeah exactly exactly you know it's kind of like a bonus absolutely all right, listen, Gary, last time, like I said, we went almost an hour. I don't want to take up that kind of time today, so I've only got a couple more questions here for you. No uh, problem. If you end up having to take a sub-only match between now and then, now in March, rather, and that that's what it's sounding like, where will it be? Are you going to do EBI, fight to win? Have you thought about that at all? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm really open to working with whichever organization. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I don't have any, like, specific restrictions, I don't believe, based on my contract. Um, you know, obviously one always would prefer to put it on if they possibly can. Um, but if they can't, I'm, I'm allowed to be competing in jiu-jitsu and stuff. So um, I'd really be willing to work with anybody. Uh, I just don't know what's going to be available in that time slot. Right. Um, and again, it, you know, they got to be able to find me somebody that's worth fighting to. So it's just like there's a lot of variables when it comes to that sort of thing. I haven't been approached by anybody with anything that's really sounded like, um, you know, it's going to be – like gonna happen anytime soon so i don't know man right. it's hard to say but All kind I'm, of i mean i'm really yeah. i'm really game for any of it the thing uh, the one thing that probably won't happen i'm guessing it would it wouldn't happen in ebi because it doesn't really seem like they're doing too much regular grappling anymore yeah it sounds all, like they pretty much the, just do this slap fighting now yeah combat jujitsu yeah yeah um have you guys put together a team for quintet yet uh john talked about it you know, he talked about us potentially doing it. Um, they haven't really, I don't know if they've reached out and said like when they were going to do it in their next event or anything like that. But I, I definitely think John was interested. You know, it seems like it's becoming more of a high profile thing uh, that a lot of people are into. So, And it's a very cool format. Is that something that would interest you in the meantime here? Yeah, I mean, I definitely love to get involved. Um, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun just cornering the last time. So Right. Now, I know you can't tell me how soon you intend on fighting for your first MMA title like we discussed last time, but to all your fans out there who are eager to see that day come, uh, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm excited about it too, you know. I think uh, I think it's coming soon. Uh, I can't say for sure, and I'm, it's not like I can't say because I know and I can't tell you guys. Like, right. they legitimately haven't, haven't said to me, like, hey, listen, you know, this fight, or, you know, win one more and, you know, we're going to give you a shot of the title. Like, nobody said anything like that to me yet. Uh, I haven't really been, like, begging for it or asking for it or anything like that. Uh, I'm just happy to get as many fights in as I possibly can for experience right now. Um, you know, if they want to give me a shot of the title, they think I deserve it, then, like, I'm ready to go uh, for sure. I, I definitely uh, am I'm going to get after it. I think currently the 55-pound uh, champion, uh, Martin Wynn, is uh, hurt. So I think they're going to do an interim title. I'm pretty sure it's going to be the next thing for them. 
Um, so I'm, I don't think I'll be involved in that. I think it would probably be the top. There's probably two top guys in the division that will fight for that first. Right. And then, um, you know, I mean, in the meantime, I'll probably be able to get, or well, I guess in the meantime, my next fight would be March. So, I, I mean, it feasibly, it's possible that, you know, you see me have like one more fight and then potentially a shot. It's possible. I, I can't say for sure. And you don't, um, you don't I, feel I, like that would be too soon? Do I think it would be too soon? Like for me, um, yeah. I think that for the average person probably would be like just, you know, in terms of like, in terms of like number of fights before, you know, you go to fight for a title. Yeah. I think it would be a little early. Um, but I'm not like, I, I don't lack confidence in my abilities to fight for that, for the title that early. Like I'm, right. I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty good about my abilities in MMA now. And like, you know, if that's when they wanted to give it to me, I think I'd feel comfortable. Well, hey, man, the, the results speak for themselves. Uh, listen, man, always appreciate the time. Always a pleasure speaking with you. I hope you enjoy Thanksgiving and grub out to celebrate yet another win. Uh, and, of course, I look forward to you, uh, you know, your next outing, whether it be, uh, you know, combat, not combat jiu-jitsu, but sub only, MMA, whatever the case is. Any shout-outs awesome. or sponsor plugs before we let you go? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, always happy to uh, to shout out my sponsors, uh, Muscle Farm. Um, it's always helping us out, helping me with my you know my weight cut and uh, you know su- any supplements and things that we need. Uh, Chimera Coffee um, and uh, Studio Five Forty has always been a long time sponsor as well. Um, I just started my new uh, apparel company. Uh, well, I, I've it's been around for a while, but I haven't actually sold anything. That the website actually went live. Uh, recently, uh, Cash Chicks Championships. So uh, we'll be selling some apparel and things out of there. You know, you're going to see more and more stuff pop up. I think we just started with a couple rash guards and like maybe some t-shirts and stuff. Um, and then uh, Armbar Soap Company. And I feel like I probably forgot some. Oh, Evolve. Uh, obviously, I always train out of there whenever I'm in. Uh, whenever I'm in Asia, I go, go head over there. You know, I was there training in their cage uh, leading up to the last fight. Um, you know, so they're always helping me out as well. So, you know, super happy to have all the support and sponsors that I do have. Um, you know, they're always uh, they're always uh, there for me, and I, I really uh, appreciate it because it's it's hard to do all this without uh, without help. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man, definitely. Uh, real quick, you said cash, chicks, and championships. That's it, baby. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Is that just the website, cashchickschampionships.com, or? You got it, man. That's it. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, again, greatly appreciate the time. Hopefully we can catch up again soon. You have a great night. I hope you get out of that traffic soon, man. Thanks, man. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Talk Take it easy. Later, guys. Thanks so much. Later. What do you guys think? Gary Tonin, mixed martial arts champion before the end of 2019? I'd say it's a safe bet. And the potential of a fight between Gary and Eddie Alvarez? That would be an amazing matchup. But it's Thanksgiving, guys. Let's keep it rolling. Wrapping things up for this episode, episode 105, BJPenn.com Radio, The Fighter's Voice. Coming up next, Christian Lee. All right, Penn Nation, please welcome to the show an incredibly exciting young athlete in mixed martial arts who's coming off a first-round stoppage at one heart of the line last weekend, the man they call the warrior, Christian Lee. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, Christian. How are you doing today, man? No problem, Jason. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. So as I mentioned, you're coming off a first round ground and pound stoppage last weekend in Singapore. How happy are you with that performance? I'm extremely happy with my performance. Um, We created a game plan uh, specific for this opponent and I was able to execute it to a T. And I feel like that's what led to such a smooth transition to the TKO stoppage. So that that was exactly how you envisioned the fight playing out. Absolutely. I I saw it play out like that in my head hundreds of times and and I knew it would be there. Wow, it doesn't get much better than that, man. When when a when not only when a plan goes to plan in in real life, but in a fight even better. Absolutely. Uh you know, but it, I feel like it just if you put in the work, the the results will show for itself and and that's what happened in this fight. I knew I knew Kazuki Tokudome was a tough opponent. You know, he's a veteran of the sport. He's fought in in multiple organizations, but um, I feel like I was I was prepared to face anything he had to throw at me. 
Now, did Kazuki do, do anything in there that surprised you at all? No, no, I, um, I, I feel like I was prepared, and when you're fully prepared, there's nothing they can do to surprise you. Right, right. Now, it must feel really good to get back in the win column coming off of a two-fight skid. We know every fight is important, but, you know, I'd imagine that it was a paramount for you to be victorious in this match. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the stakes were very high for this match, and... You know, no fighter ever wants to to lose, let alone go on a on a losing streak. So, this fight was very important for me to show the world that I am still the the best in the division. Now, although your last fight was a DQ, correct? Illegal suplex, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, correct. What what happened there? So what happened is um, I was facing a striker. From the Philippines and you know our game plan in that fight was to go in take him down early and then look for the submission or the TKO stoppage and as he was I was on his back and as he was posturing up instead of staying on his back and climbing up to his feet I just planted my foot and I redropped him over the side bringing him back down to the mat in, in wrestling it's just considered a, re- a redrop down to the mat but Instead of posting, my opponent decided to tuck his hand behind his back and, and try to grab a hold of me, that le- leaving his head completely exposed. And he did hit, he did land on the mat with his shoulder and neck. But you know, it is what it is. I I feel like it's it is the fighter's responsibility to to prepare themselves for any situation. And if you don't want to get thrown hard onto the mat you shouldn't allow yourself to be in a position where your opponent can do that to you um so very disappointed with the outcome but you know it wasn't going to stop me right so it sounds to me like the referee saw it as you spiking him on his head when in reality it was kind of him not defending the takedown properly yeah and actually the referee let the fight go on and he he actually didn't stop it until until I finished him with strikes. So after he landed, he was dazed, stunned, but not out. I followed up with strikes, and then the ref stepped in and stopped it, considering it a TKO victory in his eyes, I'm assuming, because he waited until that point to stop it. Um, And then from that point, they reviewed the tape, and some of the higher-up officials ruled it as a DQ. Man, what a bummer. Yeah, I was extremely disappointed. Wow. Now, you took this fight in Singapore. That was on short notice, correct? How long did you have to prepare? Correct. Um, I do train year-round. Um, I'm always staying fight ready. But I was preparing for a fight later on in the year, and I was on a plane ride heading over to Singapore to corner Angela. Right. And I, my sister, she got injured, unfortunately, um, and she had to withdraw from the match, and they needed um, they needed a big fight to replace that. So they called up my opponent, they called me up, asked if he wanted the fights, and we both said yes, so there it was. Right. That, Like you said, that speaks volumes to the kind of shape that you're in outside of training camp. Um, are you the type of guy that, that doesn't really take time off? Absolutely. I I take as very, very little time off of training. Um, for me, it's it just... It is my passion, and it's, it's a lifestyle for me. I, I am I'm a martial artist. My, me and my sister, my family, we are all martial artists. And we train year-round. We train to be ready anytime, anywhere. And if they, if they offered me a fight next week, I would take it. If they offered me a fight tonight, I'd take it. It's just, I feel like I'm always ready. <laughs> right, it's all about constantly evolving as a martial artist, right? Absolutely. Now, so you're back in the win column with a dominant finish, injury-free. What's next for you, man? How soon would you like to get back in there? I know you said you'd fight tonight, but realistically, how soon should we see you back in there? Realistically, um, I would like to get on a big show early next year. Um, I'm looking for February, March. I'm I'm looking for a big-name opponent. At this point, um, I will fight anyone, but I want to be careful with the matchups that I take, making sure that it aligns with my goal of fighting again for the world title. So... Whatever big name opponent I can find early in the new year, that's the fight I'll take. Now, everybody I talk to from the company seems to want to be on that card in Japan. Are you eyeing that card as well? 
Absolutely. I would love to get on that card. It's going to it's going to be historic. Definitely, definitely. And uh it sounds to me, man, like if, if they if they stack the thing like they might, uh <laughs> it'll have every big name on that card, so it'd be something very special. Uh but you you mentioned your sister there briefly. I wanted to touch on that. She was supposed to go after the second title on the same card and was forced out. Uh, I believe it was the the day before the fight. What happened there, and how was she doing? So what happened was she was training extremely hard for that fight. Um, and during our preparation, she she hurt her back. And at first, it wasn't it wasn't at one specific moment where she hurt it, but it just um, got pro- progressively worse through the camp and. So we got it checked out at the doctors, and it turns out she has a a crack in one of her discs, as no, and it's known as a bulging disc. Right. It's putting pressure on the ner- nerve, and it's it's just it's without a doubt. I believe that she could have gone in there and finished her opponent, but it's not worth the long term risk. So we we talked about it, and we thought it was best to let it heal fully. Doctors say six to eight weeks of absolutely nothing to let it rest and heal up. And then we'll start working to get back in defense and fight for the second belts. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, that's very wise of uh, you and your team and your sister to, to make that decision. So many times we hear about fighters going into fights injured. Almost every single one of you guys and gals go into a fight, not at a hundred percent because of how brutal this sport is. But when you have a serious injury like that, making the wise decision to not, like you said, uh, make any long-term problems definitely the best bet yeah absolutely you know we all want to we all want to see her have long long career after fighting so safety is always first now j- just to stay on the topic of Angela for a moment I'm sure you get asked this all the time but uh, what was it like for you to be what I believe is the only brother and sister duo in the sport <laughs> yeah it was great it was great all all the way from um from my early teenage years competing traveling around the world it's it's always been great you know my sister and I are very close um we're best friends everyone knows how close we are and um it's i feel like it's it's just a blessing to be able to travel the world with my sister with my dad you know that as that as our team and um just doing what we love right sharing all those experiences as a family what was it like growing up as a martial arts family? Did you guys fight a lot? Who was the badass of, of the both of you when you were growing up? Oh, for sure. It was Angela. <laughs> yeah, she, absolutely. I'm not even not going to lie, but um as as we grew older, we were just able to, you know, share more experiences together and and help each other evolve as martial artists and fighters. Right. Now, being that she's a huge star already and a champion, Obviously, you're proud of her, very happy for her, but do you feel like you kind of live in her shadow at all, or is her success just motivation for you to accomplish accomplish as much or more? No, you know, for me, um, I, I look at her career, and, and I'm I'm just extremely proud. I'm super happy for her, um, and I'm on my own journey. I don't I don't look at anyone else's careers and and envy them or want to be like them. I, I just feel like I'm on my own journey. I'm on my set path, and the world title will come in in time. But for now, I'm just enjoying the journey, enjoying each step, and trying to be the best best person, best martial artist I can be. That's a huge part of it, man. Enjoy the journey, that's for sure. Uh, changing gears here for a moment, you know, since this is, this is our first conversation together, I always bring this up with uh, athletes from one championship. The focus of the company on the purity of martial arts is is not only refreshing, but as of late, it seems to be a power shift towards the old school way of doing things. I'm wondering, would you agree with that? And how happy are you to be involved with a company that stays away from the Western style of promotion and focuses on the skills of their athletes? Well, you know, for me, it's it's sort of a win win. The fact that they don't promote the trash talk, I'm, I'm not very outspoken i don't like to trash talk to my opponents and so i guess a lot of people would um consider it boring if you don't want to engage in trash talk so you know it works out good for me i can just do my own thing and show the world my skill rather than talk 
Right, and in regards to the power shift, I mean, uh, you know, Misha Tate had said something to uh, one of our guys uh, who was there for the for the event in Singapore. You know, she was talking about a, a power shift and how it seems to be moving east right now. Do, do you feel that way? I mean, with all these big signings? Absolutely. I really do feel like one championship is the next big thing. I feel, I feel like the more people are hearing about it, the more they're researching it, they, they really see that it's, it's, it's martial arts in its purest form in the sense that it's just two people that want to go in there and test themselves. It's nothing more than that. After the fights, you see fighters shaking hands. Before the fight, you see them shaking hands. And, and it's, I, you know, I, I enjoy it very much. I am very happy fighting with this promotion. Yeah, I'll tell you, man. As as a guy who's watched <clears throat> mixed martial arts for for many many years, it's again, it's it's very refreshing to see a company with this kind of focus on, like you said, the purity of the sport. Uh, you know, the signing of Mighty Mouse Eddie Alvarez, now even Misha Tate joining the company in an executive position. All that says, you know, it says a lot about the the continued success of one championship and and that they're doing things the right way, like we're talking about. Uh, what was your reaction to those three th- that I just mentioned joining the company? And do you think we'll see a lot more athletes following suit? I absolutely believe like that there will be many more signings um, after Misha, Mighty Mouse, and Eddie Alvarez. And I feel like those, those three key players just opened the door for all the new fighters that you know didn't didn't know much about one championship, especially from America. Um, the fight, the UFC fighters are really going to shift their focus. I feel, and I feel like in the next few months, years, there will be a lot more signings, and I feel like one championship will be the biggest martial arts promotion in the world. And that's got to be pretty cool for you, being a lightweight. I mean, Eddie, he, he might compete at one seventy. Uh, you know, considering the the, the weight cut issues or uh, the, how one championship handles weight cutting. But, you know, the possibility of some big-name lightweights coming over, you must be very happy to hopefully compete against some of them in the future. Absolutely. I'm excited that all of these big names are coming into the organization, and I'm I'm hoping to fight one of them soon. I'm just I'm, – I'm eager. I'm always ready, and I would love to jump in that lightweight tournament if, if someone drops out. Yeah, how does that work, right? I mean, obviously you've got your name in the hat for an alternate, but – I'm kind of surprised that they didn't involve you in that tournament. Yeah, the thing is, actually, um, right now I'm fighting at featherweight at 155, and their lightweight division is actually 170. So when they did the shift, um, taking out the weight cutting, the dehydration, they moved up each weight division by one. So featherweight is 155, welterweight, uh, lightweight is 170, welterweight is 185, all the way up the board. Oh, yeah, that's right, huh? So I'm over here reading things inaccurately. That's correct. You are technically a featherweight, but you fight at 155. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So getting back to what's next for you, uh, what are your goals for 2019? Do you hope to be in another title fight You know, sometime next year? Absolutely. Um, I'm looking for, for shoot, if, if right now champ Martin Ewan, he's injured. Um, if he can't step up, I'll, I'm looking for an interim fight. If not, I'm looking for another big name fight to get me in that number one contender position to fight, rematch him for the belt. Um, next year, I have I have big plans. I'm looking to take over the featherweight division and eventually move up to lightweight. So we'll see how it goes. Now, obviously, one championship, they've done a lot with the interim titles. It seems like anytime a champion is not ready, to compete, they, they they institute an interim championship. So it sounds like that's probably a real likelihood that you would be fighting for an interim belt, depending on when Martin Nguyen can can come back. Yeah, you know, for me, it's they they seem to be doing it a lot. So uh, I'm just gonna call for it. I want to stay busy as busy as possible, and I'm just focused on my journey. So I'm hoping to get a big fight soon. Now you mentioned uh, moving up to to uh, lightweight to 170. I mean, being that you're a young guy, obviously you're going to put on a, put on some more weight, some more muscle as you get older. What uh, when do you th- expect that transition to happen? Are you the type of guy that might go after two two weight divisions, or do you think you'll eventually focus on moving up to 170 as a permanent thing? 
Yeah, I feel I feel like um I have a lot of work to do in the featherweight division still. Uh, but once I clear that out, then it will be no problem for me to shift my weight up and start competing at lightweight 170. Um, and then from there, who, who knows? By the end of my career, I could be at middleweight. Right. <laughs> the, the can't read the future, that's for sure, man. But uh, speaking of which, you know, talking about Martin, uh, obviously that's a rematch that you want, a fight that you want back. What did you take away from the first fight, and what kind of adjustments would you make in the rematch? Uh, in the rematch, uh, it it will play out very differently. I stepped in. I gave him a little bit too much respect. I didn't push the pace that I needed to push. And in my preparations for that fight, I was actually in a cast for six out of the eight weeks preparing for that fight. Um, after my fight with Kazunori Yukota, I broke my left thumb. And then I got the call to fight Martin in May. And... I had two months to heal up my thumb and prepare at the same time. So that meant no sparring at all. I was just doing a lot of cardio, a lot of reflexive drills, and I wasn't able to get sparring in. And it actually it played out in the fight. I feel like my timing was slightly off, and there was a lot of things I could have done differently to change the result. And with all of that, it still came down to a split decision, which I still feel I, win. I won. So um, I know... I. I'm very confident that the next match will play out differently. Yeah, that, that's a bummer, huh? I mean, when an opportunity like that comes knocking, you have to take it regardless of, of you know, having that, that nagging injury. But uh, it sounds to me, man, like giving another shot when you're healthy, like you said, went to split decision, could be a much different fight. Absolutely. I believe that I'll finish him in one round. Wow, all right. Uh, so looking forward, looking ahead for the immediate future, any ideas on who your next opponent might be? Or are you eyeing any matchup in particular? Uh, you know, right now the featherweight division is is pretty stacked, but I'm looking to fight any top contender. Um, Jadamba is on a win streak, um, and I know he's floating right up there in the top contenders. Um, Koyomi Matsushima just knocked out Murat Gafarov. He's another one at the top. Um, and, and whoever they throw at me, I'll, I'll be ready. I just want to stay busy, as busy as possible and you know, keep performing to the best of my abilities. Well, regardless, Christian, as I said earlier, man, you're one of the most exciting young talents in the game today. I very much look forward to your next fight and all the future has in store for you, man. Uh, in conclusion, tell all the fans out there what they can expect from you going forward and uh, where can people find you on social media? Moving forward, you guys can expect a very busy 2019 and one to two title runs. I promise you that. You guys can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Christian Lee MMA. Please follow, subscribe. Thank you guys for listening. Again, it was a pleasure to speak with you, man. Anything you think we missed? Any shout outs, sponsor plugs? The floor is yours, my friend. I just want to say thank you to you know my teams that always support me united mma evolve mma one championship best mma pr promotion in the world thank you guys all right thanks again for the time today christian again it's a pleasure speaking with you i hope we can catch up again soon you have a great night over there across the world my friend thank you jason take care man you too buddy later again like i said before one of the hottest young prospects in the business, incredibly talented with a champion's mindset, surrounds himself with a champion and his sister, and what a cool story they both have together, right? Like I said, I cannot think of another brother and sister duo that competes in mixed martial arts. Very cool stuff. But that's it for us, folks. Again, to all of our American listeners, happy Thanksgiving to the rest of you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Make sure you guys follow us on social media at BJ Penn Radio. Make sure you guys follow the website on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Set up alerts. Stay up to date on the sport that you love of mixed martial arts. Until next time, my friends, we'll catch you on the flip side, everybody. Peace out.